tonight as the deadline for herders to vacate Ondo forest reserves expires. Cattle Herders Association Mieti Alice is set to meet with Southwest governors tomorrow for a way out of the crisis. Let's give dialogue a chance. Oyo state government and police authorities appeal to stakeholders in Wari Igongon communities. Bandits killed seven persons in fresh attack on Niger communities, abduct several others as chairman of Ardokola local government area is killed in Taraba. And days after President Joe Biden's inauguration, U.S. COVID-19 cases hit a record 25 million as the administration describes the vaccine rollout plan of its predecessor as chaotic. Plus sports and international news. Peace may be on the horizon of the face-off between the Ondo state government and the Fulani herdsmen operating in the state as the deadline for the herders to vacate the state's forests expires tonight. And that's because the leaders of Mieti Ala Cattle Breeders Association of Nigeria are set to meet with governors from southwest regions tomorrow to work out a solution to the face-off between the Ondo state governor and the herders. The Ondo State Commissioner for Information, Donald Odrogo, told Channel Television that the meeting will be held in Akure, the state capital, by 12 noon on Monday. The meeting, according to the state government, is aimed at deliberating on the way out of the incessant clashes between herders and farmers, as well as criminal activities such as kidnapping, rape and murder in southwest states, which have mostly been linked to herdsmen. One week ago, Governor Akeridulu had issued a seven-day ultimatum to the herdsmen in all forest reserves in the state to vacate the area. The governor said the ultimatum became necessary due to the resurgence of banditry and other security challenges facing the state. He also placed a ban on night grazing and movement of cattle within cities and highways in the state. The presidency, however, faltered the directive, insisting that the constitution does not allow anyone to evict a Nigerian from any part of the country. But the governor's decision got the backing of farmers and forest guards and transporters in the states who staged a peaceful protest in the capital last Thursday to express their total support for the governor's action. Meanwhile, yesterday's unrest in some communities in Oyo State has also prompted the state government and police authorities in the state to call for a peaceful dialogue among major stakeholders. A state governor who was represented by his special advisor on security, Mr. Fatai Owushini, is appealing to all concerned to find a way to return to communal tolerance and understanding to fight off attacks from bandits and kidnappers. The state police commissioner of police, on her part, appealed for calm and asked that all stakeholders meet at the command headquarters before the end of the week to find lasting solution to the crisis. Igogong, Ago, Are and Tede have been engulfed in crisis for over a week following the rampant killings and kidnappings in the area. The police chief also assured that security has been beefed up at the two border towns in Ngongon to forestall breakdown of law and order in the area. The youth in the community had accused the Fulani community of complicity in the acts of kidnapping, banditry and killings of their kinsmen. Forward is for all of us to be peaceful, to stay calm. Don't take laws into our hands. If there are any infractions, Report to the security agencies and we'll do the needful. Instead of fighting amongst ourselves, violence does not uh, solve any issue. Staying with security, we're moving from Oyo State to Niger State, where at least seven persons have been killed by bandits in Kafinkoro and adjoining villages in Paikoro local government area of the state, with about 10 persons also said to be injured by the gunmen. And these images we're about to show you show patients receiving treatment at a hospital in the aftermath of the attack carried out in Kubi, Kudami, Abolo, Guajo and Zonkolo communities. A resident there says the attackers, numbering about 50 and heavily armed, stormed the villages on motorcycles last night in a raid that lasted until this morning. Also confirming the attack to Channel's television, the senator represented Niger East Senatorial District, where the attacks took place. Mohamed Sani Musa said the attackers rustled over 1,000 cattle. 
The latest attack comes barely a week after a Catholic priest, Father John Bakung, was killed by gunmen along Lambata Laipai Road in Gurara, local government area of the state. To the northeast in Taraba State, where gunmen suspected to be kidnappers killed the chairman of Ardo Kola local government area, Salihu Dovo. Mr. Dovo was kidnapped at his residence in Sabungari area of Jalingo, the state capital, in the early hours of today and taken to an unknown destination where he was killed. According to a family source, the gunmen, who were 20 in number, also killed his nephew, Timothy Aminu, who tried to resist them from moving further with him. It is closed that no ransom was demanded from the family before the murder. Meanwhile, the police spokesman, Mr. David Misao, has confirmed that two people have been arrested in connection with the crime. The military says troops of Operation Thunderstrike have killed several, several bandits in Chikum, local government area of Kaduna State, as the military continues its onslaught against them. According to a statement, the bandits were shot dead during a joint ground and air operation on Saturday in Chikwale village in Chikum, local government area. The Kaduna State Commissioner for Internal Security and Home Affairs, Samuel Arwan, explains that the patrols followed credible reports of bandits' movement from a neighboring state towards Akibu in Kachia local government area. He asked that the air components thereafter conducted further armed reconnaissance into the forest and scores of persons who they call armed bandits were sighted on motorcycles around Gidan Sule. They said the bandits reportedly scampered for safety as they were engaged by the fighter jet crew. And for Governor Bello Matawale of Zamfara State, bandits who refuse to embrace the peace deal offered by the state government will be dealt with decisively until they surrender their arms. The governor says it will continue to engage the armed bandits and other criminals in peace and dialogue to make them better citizens. He said this during a visit to some communities recently attacked in the state to commiserate with them. He also shared the communities of more security, asking them to protect their communities by exposing criminals. Uh, personnel in the state, which we are all committed to this peace deal, and all our traditional rulers and the, all the stakeholders, including the ulamas of the state, they are all subscribed to our peace initiative, and we are going to follow it step by step. And I assure the citizens of the state and the nation at large that we are going to succeed by Allah's will, inshallah. I therefore appeal to my people to be peacekeeping and to make sure that they shouldn't take law into their heart because that is the problem we're having always. And as you are aware, we have sent uh, the SA humanitarian to come and give some support of food stock to the victims uh, and we have given uh, cash to those victims of five million today. And uh, we are going to provide adequate security to come to Jambaku and remain here and be seated here. So I ask the people of this uh, uh, village, uh, Jambaku district, to supply all information and credible intelligence to the security that will be posted to this district. We're in Ebony State, where the state government has imposed a dusk to dawn curfew on Eza and Eza Fiom communities in Ohaku local government area of the state. The governor, David Umahi, gave the directive today as he frowned on the unabated violence and wanton destruction of lives and property in the community in Ohaku local government area. This followed a communal clash which engulfed the two settlements as a result of a dispute over leadership involving the National Union of Road Transport Workers in the area. The curfew, which will last from 4 p.m. to 8 a.m., according to the governor, is to prevent those who are bent on taking undue advantage of the cover of the night to cause more carnage. The governor further directs the security agencies to ensure strict enforcement. To other stories now, the COVID-19 response team, as well as patients 
at the Guagualada Isolation and Treatment Center in the nation's capital are asking the federal government to urgently address the challenge of understaffing and delay in response to patients with severe COVID-19 cases. The response team says the center, which only admits mid to severe cases of COVID-19, is desperately overstretched with only two nurses and a doctor attending daily to 35 COVID-19 patients. Our correspondent, Gloria Omezuki, reports. We're now at the isolation center here at the University of Abuja Teaching Hospital in Guagualada. We've been given exclusive access to the center where patients with severe confirmed cases of COVID-19 are being treated. There are 26 wards and 35 patients at the Guagualada COVID-19 Isolation and Treatment Center. Some have to be paired in a single ward. These are patients admitted with severe cases of the coronavirus. I've been dealing with this thing since the 18th of December. I thought it was malaria and typhoid. Been to two hospitals, got treated at home by a doctor, had to move to another facility in town. When I came in here, I had um, a lot of pain, my chest, uh, my spine, all over my body. My neck was swollen because I had an infection. The patients in each ward vary in age, some in their 30s, 40s, and even the elderly, like Mama, the oldest patient at 93 years. She is responding well, but still needs oxygen to breathe. Some others are overcoming the worst symptoms of the coronavirus. By the time I left the East and I came back here, I had it rated and I was having problems breathing. The nurses and doctors, you can see that I think they are probably understaffed, but you can see them stretching to make sure that they, they, they meet you at every point of need. Dr. Vivian Kwage is the house manager. She is among doctors working on the front lines. She underscores that oxygen, food and other medical items are not in short supply. And we had this shortage of oxygen you know, at the beginning of the second wave. But that is a thing of the past right now. Our chief medical director you know, you know, um, sent out like an SOS plea and we got uh, help. This is the only COVID center that has dialysis machine in the FCT. She further tells me that she has worked in infectious disease centers, but has seen nothing like this. Particularly those with severe COVID complicated by sepsis can present with acute kidney injury. So that is the case with Michelle. She came in with acute kidney injury. We pray that she will not uh, need um, dialysis. As the number of COVID-19 cases surge across the country, there are fears that the overwhelmed response team might become too desperate to help. But this is the only centre that caters to the severe cases of the coronavirus infections. Uh, the centre is really hoping that the major challenge of understaffing would be speedily attended to in order to speed up response to patients. From the Guagualada Isolation Center, Gloria Umezuke, Channel Television News. In part two after the break, Governor Babajide Somolu speaks on plans to vaccinate Lagos residents. Please join us again. Welcome back. If you just joined us to watch the news at 10 live on Channel's Television, Lagos, a reminder of our top stories. As the deadline for herders to vacate Ondo Forest Reserves expires tonight, Cattle Herders Association, Mieti Alice, set to meet with Southwest Governors tomorrow for a way out of the crisis. Let's give dialogue a chance. Oyo State Government and police authorities appeal to stakeholders in warring Igogon communities. Bandits kill seven persons in fresh attack on Niger communities. Abduct several others as chairman of Ardo Kola local government area is killed in Taraba. And days after President Joe Biden's inauguration, U.S. COVID-19 cases hit a record 25 million as the administration describes the vaccine rollout plan of its predecessor as chaotic.
Incident Commander of Nigeria's epicenter in the fight against COVID-19 pandemic and Lagos State Governor Babajide Somulu has assured that his government is leaving no stone unturned in ensuring that as many people as possible in the state get accelerated vaccination. The governor also revealed that the Lagos State Government is making other plans to ensure mass vaccination apart from the arrangements being made by the Presidential Task Force on COVID-19. As a subnational, we're also taking our destiny to our hands. We've started conversations with all of the vaccine, um, um, with some of the vaccine manufacturers. You know, Pfizer, um, for example, I've made contact with them. Um, the Oxford um, AstraZeneca, I've made contact with them. You know, Johnson & Johnson are not out yet. Um, the Madela, they've written to us, we've written back to them. So we are making our own subnational contacts, you know, and, and part of the things that will come out of it is that once we see what the national is doing, because this is also something that we do not want to begin to deal with middlemen or people that are not, you know, um, the frontline um, 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 suppliers in, in some of these vaccines. You know, we don't want, we don't want to run foul of, of, of the protocols, you know, but we've started making, you know, the contact even at the board level with, with um, the manufacturers, you know, but how that will, will work out, we, we still have a week or two to see, you know, but, but we started making the contacts already. Governor Babajide Sanwalu speaking on our political program Sunday Politics earlier today. In the meantime, the new public health behaviour adopted by many in the initial stage of COVID-19 pandemic appears to have fizzled out. Uh, people can no longer sustain hand washing protocol, even as a severe variant takes over and despite scientific proof of its effect against the spread of COVID-19. Our correspondent, Hajira Ali, reports that hand-washing facilities acquired with huge sums of money have been abandoned in many public places. This is what we found in most public spaces in Bochi. Hand-washing facilities covered in dust and cobwebs, mostly deserted, absent in some places, or simply put aside. <laughs> The initial approval that greeted hand washing with soap and running water in the early days of COVID-19 pandemic has disappeared very fast. Millions of naira were spent to purchase some of these facilities, only for them to be abandoned amid warning of a deadly variant. Yes, so, coronavirus, aka COVID-19, don't go for Nigeria. Wash your hands with soap and water. The local media still convey jingles on safety protocols, but this seems to be falling on deaf ears. I'm about to step into one of the supermarkets in Bochi and I need to wash my hands before I go in. I can see a hand washing facility in front of it. Let me find out if it's functional. There's actually water here, but I can't see soap anywhere to wash my hands. It doesn't appear anyone has been using it. We, we used to provide at times, but you know, it come to a state whereby nobody even cared to even wash his hand or something like that. So we are even tired. Honestly, we are even tired. And nowadays, our main problem is not even corona. The demand for hand sanitizers have also dropped drastically, as confirmed by a store manager. Why would people rescind so fast a positive public health behavior they approved? From the social medicine point of view, this medical doctor explains the perceived low risk by many, among other factors. There seems to be a disconnection between the society and what the government wants to achieve. Our control measures are not uh, very strong enough. At the same time, there is no adequate public health enlightenment to enable people to sustain the behavior that they have started. And this is what we are seeing at the end of the day. We are now going back to square one. A psychologist at the Federal Polytechnic Bochi offers more perspectives. We are naturally deviant. We tend to actually abridge some of the rules that actually are made to help us. So a lot of people actually are not subscribing to that because they feel this is something coming from the government. And there is what we call distrust issue. And there is also a problem of what we call cognitive dissonance. That is inconsistency with our thoughts and our actions. Personal hygiene should be a daily routine. As a matter of fact, it is embedded in the SDG goals. Goal number six. As much is being done to provide access to hand-washing facilities, 
people must also learn to embrace healthy lifestyles. Hajira Aliyu, Channels Television News. Officers and men of the Nigeria police have no reason not to wear face masks and comply with other COVID-19 protocols in the course of their duties. That's according to the Nigeria to Nigeria's number one police officer, Mohamed Adamu. He told Channel Television's Ladi Akredulale on our current affairs program, Newsnight, that as a result of the various interventions and support, the police has adequate supplies of the various personnel, uh, various personal protective equipment. Apart from the medical personnel, the next group of people that are vulnerable are the police officers because we enforce the, 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 the rules. Um, in every command from the beginning, we had intervention from different organizations supporting the police with hand sanitizers, masks, and the rest of them. And we distributed them to all the commands. We, so we believe that every police officer should have series of marks with him or with her when they are performing their duties. But it baffles us to see that they don't use it. Though sometimes for some people, for health reasons, it's so difficult for them to use the mask. But then, putting the mask for some minutes, especially when you are coming close, and you are coming in close contact with an individual, wouldn't irritate you or cause you much problem. So we have distributed a lot of this uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, PPEs yes, to all our officers, all the commands. You can watch the full interview with the Inspector General of Police uh, on Newsnight. It airs tomorrow, January 25th, 2021 at 9 p.m. right here on Channels Television. The Pan-African Youth Development Network is calling on the federal government to look into cases of alleged slavery and injustice meted on Nigerian youths working in factories owned by foreign investors. The organization made the call when it visited a ceramics company in Ajaukuta, Kogi State. They insist that the company has violated the Factory Act 2004 of the Federal Republic of Nigeria in relation to health, safety, hazard and precautionary measures. Calls by workers of BN Ceramic Company complaining of alleged dehumanization and exploitation by the management is a reason why the president of the Pan-African Youth Development Network and some of its executive members paid a visit to BN Ceramics Company at Jaukuta for an on-the-sport assessment. For hours, the management paid no attention to the visitors despite the notice informing them of their visit. They threatened to mobilize for the shutting down of the company if the management fails to show up. Somebody, somebody must be here, be here now. Somebody must be in charge of this company. Who is in charge of this company now? A meeting was later organized between both parties that lasted several hours. The team explained the reason for the visit and how a staff of the company was killed, an allegation the human resource manager refutes. Our point is just one. We can't sit down and allow our youth being mistreated. We can't sit down and allow our youth being treated like slaves in their own country. Now we are calling on Mr. President, our father and our leader of this country, to look into the injustice being done to the staffs and youths of BN Ceramics. Through the Minister of Labor and Productivity, we are soliciting that immediate action should be taken. A tour of the companies embarked upon leading to more revelations on the ordeals of the workers, one of which is the absence of portable water. The team briefs the press and the management on the outcome of the tour. Please convert all our casual workers to full staff. That will give them a life. That is what is called earnings in labor. We have demanded for a, uh, a, a pipe bomb water that is clean and drinkable water. The kind of, we have demanded for welfare for you people. We have demanded that your clinics 
should be fully equipped. The sales manager of the company in his response makes a promise to address the situation. All the demands as stated by the president of the Pan-African Youth Congress, we are go the management is going to address it appropriately and very soon without any hesitation. As the team make their way out of the company, the workers are assured of improved welfare and better working conditions. When the news of 10 returns, barely 24 hours after eight people were killed in a truck accident in Ondo State, 19 people have again been killed in separate accidents in Kwara and Kaduna States. Join us again. Welcome back. Four persons have reportedly died in a multiple motor accident along Ilori Ogbomosho Express Road in Kwara State earlier today. The state sector commander of the FRSC, Mr. Jonathan Owade, says the accident occurred close to the Ilori International Airport. Airport Road following a head-on collision involving a commercial bus and a truck. The four dead victims include two males and two females. And while a similar incident happened in Kaduna State this time, claiming 15 lives along the Abuja-Kaduna Highway, state authorities said the accident was caused by vehicles driving in the opposite direction to oncoming traffic. A trailer conveying grains and motorcycles to Abuja collided with, another, with other vehicles, forcing them to veer off the pavement. Apart from the 15 persons that died, four others were injured and are receiving treatment in hospital. And the dangerous potholes on the Abuja-Kaduna-Kano Highway may disappear soon as the Federal Ministry of Works and Housing says that they will be fixed in about two weeks as part of measures to reduce the frequent vehicle accidents and constant attacks by bandits on the busy road. The federal government is given assurance of speedy completion. The Abuja-Kaduna Highway is the gateway into the northwest states and the nation's federal capital territory. It also serves as a major link between the southern part of the country and the north. Due to the heavy vehicular traffic on the road, it is now in a very deplorable condition, with many sections of the road filled with dangerous potholes, leading to frequent motor accidents. It is also constituting a security threat for commuters. Though the reconstruction of the road is ongoing, road users are not happy with the slow pace of work. They should do something fast to do something fast. You lose time, you lose money, you lose life, and so many things are being lost in government not doing the needful. We appeal to them. They are trying, but they can do more. But what is responsible for the delay? This road was built over about... Five. About 1995 was when it was constructed. That's how many years ago? That's about 25 years ago. Yes, yes, yes. And the traffic volume on this road as at that time is by far less than 20% of what you have today. And unfortunately, when you design, you design for a particular volume of traffic. But the traffic is carried now is by far higher than what it was designed for. The permanent secretary in the Federal Ministry of Works and Housing insists that those hoping for the speedy completion of the road project would have to be patient as the project will be completed in 2023. He, however, explains that the fixing of dangerous potholes will commence immediately, while the main construction continues. Precisely the reason we're on site today, we're doing some palliative measures, paripa su, the main construction work. Obviously, you can see, especially the outbound road, Abuja Kano, carry heavy load and haulages, petroleum products, you know, containers. So, therefore, the potholes are an impediment. And above all of that, they are also a security threat. So this is why we are here today on the instruction of the minister to inspect. And in two weeks' time, those bad portions of the road, the critical portions of part of the road will be addressed. They will be fixed. The Abuja-Kaduna Highway has become an issue of concern among major stakeholders, including federal lawmakers, with many travelers now opting for train services due to the insecurity on the deplorable road. 
We saw the situation of the second wave of coronavirus in the nation's capital, Abuja. But here in Lagos, the second wave has presented increased number of cases in Nigeria. And that's according to health practitioners in the state. A visit by our crew to the Yaba Infectious Diseases Hospital, a 350-bed facility where victims of coronavirus are being managed, shows an increase in demand for medical attention and oxygen by patients. Our correspondent, Olu Phillips, tells us more. A typical day in the bustling city of Lagos, the commercial nerve center of Nigeria, as people make their way through the day amidst a terrible pandemic that keeps threatening the economy and well-being of nations, including Nigeria. Findings show that it's still a mixed bag of adherence to protocols aimed at slowing the disease. To underscore the dangers associated with unprotected lifestyle, our crew is visiting one of the most active biosecurity complexes in Nigeria, an infectious disease center in Yaba. Before the tour, we are briefed by the State Commission of Health, Dr. Bayami, about this complex. The place is full of COVID-19. You're either a patient diagnosed with COVID-19 or you're a relative. We are likely to be, the chances that the relatives of the patients are positive are high. The place is full of medical personnel, many of which are infected. Some of them know it, some of them don't know it. Some people have come in randomly or by reference to conduct a COVID test, which for safety reasons and for exigencies of reducing viral load is done in the open. Statistics from this center shows that the demand for oxygen has risen from 60 large cylinder bottles daily to about 300 owing to high record of cases, to which the government has responded swiftly by installing this embedded oxygen plant to meet the rising demand. This is the ICU unit and two patients are currently on ventilators. We are told the longer, the lower the chances. Prayers for them. Every second we can know, we can see what is happening here. They are real patients, real Nigerians currently receiving treatment, as we will show you shortly. You can't mess around here, so we have to don the right apparel. Yes, the air in there is filtered, but we are told the virus is active. Here we go. All over this isolation ward are people fighting for their life. Incidentally, they are all on oxygen to aid breathing. <coughs> to underscore the consequences of this situation, some patients opted to have their identities on camera. I from yesterday that I was moved into this facility at Yava. I know there is COVID and people should protect themselves very well. It is real. And I pray for Nigerians that God Almighty should take COVID away from us. So, some people think COVID, no COVID. No, it's dead. Huh? It's dead. In the last 48 hours, 10 people were wheeled out of this place because they lost the battle. This is a 76-bed male ward isolation center here in Yaba. And the doctors tell me that in the last two weeks, it's been very hectic managing um, the health crisis of many Nigerians who have come in here. 50 mortality has been recorded in the last two weeks. First, you want to overcome the problem of uh, is uh, real, is not real. And I think we are overcoming it. More and more people are now uh, aware that COVID-19 is real because more and more people close home are falling for the disease. From this center of over 250 beds, many have recovered. Sadly also, close to 100 have died. 
But that's not all. There's also a growing trend of post-COVID survival syndrome, which presents problems in the heart, intestines, and so on. Olu Phillips, Channel Television News. Small-scale palm oil farmers in Benin City, the Edo State Capital, say they are willing to key into government's diversification exercise through oil palm production only if the government offers them the needed assistance. The agency directly responsible for this is the Nigeria Institute for Oil Palm Research, NIFOR, and it says it has been diligent in carrying out its functions. However, some small-scale farmers who spoke to Channel's television insist the agency hardly reaches out to them. In the 50s and 60s, Nigeria was the largest exporter and producer of palm oil. According to Index Monday, Nigeria now ranks the fifth highest producer in the world after Indonesia, Thailand, Malaysia and Colombia. The World Bank says Nigeria consumed approximately three metric tons of fats and oils in 2018, with palm oil accounting for 44.7% or 1.34 million metric tons, which makes Nigeria Africa's largest consumer of palm oil products. The challenges of palm oil production is better told by the farmers themselves. Eddie Obasuyi has a farm in the outskirts of Benin. He believes that they could do with more help from NIFA. For quite a while now, there's no really synergy between NIFA and the oil palm producers in this um, locality. Ideally, we ought to look up to NIFA for guidance in this oil palm business. But um, as of now, I can't remember when last I even visited NIFA or NIFO even um, try to kind of contact the oil palm growers around this um, area. Then we bring the, the wasted one here. Rehaen Udo's farm is located at Urokosa Unwode local government area of Edo state. He agrees with Mr. Obasui. According to him, self-help is the driving force. So all this farm you see now, I'm the one who planted it, I would line it and planted it. I would not con consult anybody from Nifo. I did it myself. I only go there and bought the seeds and come here and plant, that's all. Nifo's core mandate is to conduct research into the production and products of oil palm and other palms of economic importance and transfer its research findings to farmers and the research body's executive director in Benin strongly believes that they have not in any way failed to deliver accordingly. We are providing the right quality seed. The seed that we provide now, for instance, can mature in two and a half years. It uh, does, uh, in the first one year harvest, you can do, get as much as eight tons per hectare of uh, fruit. And you can actually drive that, that to about 25 tons in about eight years of, uh, of production uh, per hectare. We also train um, farmers. Then we, uh, now for small, very small scale farmers, we fabricate equipment for them for the process. There is more. NIFO's head of agronomics and farm manager explains that over two decades of research have yielded seedlings that can compare to the best in the world. The hybrid that we have now, the Tenera hybrid that we have now, is a crossing of the Presifera with the Dura. So the Dura parents, the parents that we have improved on all over the year, it is not a one-day job. This, the the, the Pisivera and the Dura parents that we improved on have taken us 40 less than 28 years. So if there is anything they think that they will bring from outside the country that can compete with our material, let them come. We will tell them that, no, our is still better than what they are bringing from outside the country. Nigeria's annual requirement for palm oil is about 2.5 million metric tons, while only 1.25 million metric tons, or 50%, is domestically produced, leaving a gap of 1.25 million metric tons that is filled through importation, giving rise to foreign exchange exposure of $500 million annually. 
Perpetrators of violence against persons in Nasarawa state will henceforth face stiff penalties as Governor Abdullahi Suley has signed the VAP bill into law. The law stipulates life imprisonment for anyone found guilty of committing rape and other forms of assault. This is coming on the heels of the prosecution of Adam Yarrow, who was apprehended for defiling a three-month-old baby in 2020. Our correspondent Halima Gayom reports. <laughs> They are dressed in black, marching through the streets with placards expressing resentment. These form part of the reactions of Nasarawa State women in 2020 when a three month old baby, Rukaya, was defiled. Vehemently, they condemned the act as they seek an end to it. The peaceful demonstration sparks a swift action from the government and security agencies as personnel of the Nigeria Security and Civil Defense Corps nabbed this young man, Adam Yaru, who confessed to the crime and is facing trial. The House of Assembly also weighs in with the swift passage of the Violence Against Persons Bill. This is a bill for a law to prohibit all forms of violence against persons and provide maximum protection and effective remedies for victims and for related matters there to third reading and pass. The speaker is the sponsor of the bill, which stipulates stiff penalties. We are provided a stiffer penalties that will uh, ensure that anybody found to have participated, I mean, uh, to have violated that uh, provisions of the law will definitely go for a lifetime jail. The bill is signed into law, leaving no room for perpetrators to escape. By signing these uh, bills into law, you know, we'll continue to work now very hard and ensure that uh, you know, we are implementing them strictly in line with the law. As the helpless mother of the victim nurses a child through the healing process, she puts her hope on the judiciary. I want the courts to look at what's been done to the girl and serve justice. Anyone found guilty, the law should be allowed to prevail. In the VAP law, life imprisonment is the penalty for rape or any form of sexual assault. Whether the law will triumph in Rukaya's case if the suspect is found guilty is a question concerned groups seek answer to as they monitor the turnout of events. Halima Gayam, Channels Television News. U.S. President Joe Biden's uh, chief of staff, Ron Klen, has criticized the Trump administration's rollout of the COVID-19 vaccine, describing it as chaotic and very limited. As comes as the United States reports more than 25 million coronavirus cases with more than 417,500 deaths linked to the virus. Here's the global update. Ron Klain's comments were made on NBC's Meet the Press. He dissed the previous administration for not having a plan to deal with the pandemic. The process to distribute the vaccine, particularly outside of nursing homes and hospitals, out into the community as a whole. Meanwhile, the U.S. Center for Disease Control and Prevention says it has administered 20,537,990 doses of COVID-19 vaccines in the country as of Saturday morning and distributed 41,411,550 doses. The tally of vaccine doses are for both Moderna and pfizer IonTech vaccines vaccines as of 6 a.m. local time on Sunday. And in Europe, Russia says it can supply Hungary with its Sputnik V coronavirus vaccine from next month after Budapest gave initial approval to the shot, which was also registered for domestic use on Thursday by the United Arab Emirates. Russia is seeking international endorsement for Sputnik V, named after the satellite that triggered the Cold War space race and is steadily building up its global customer base. It has signed numerous supply deals and regulators in 11 countries have now granted approval for the shot's domestic use. 
Germany has stepped up efforts to stop coronavirus variants such as the mutation that originated in the UK from spreading throughout Germany by implementing tougher border controls. The country's federal police was instructed to carry out exhaustive controls of travelers arriving from high-risk areas and check in whether they carried a negative test with them and the needed forms to enter the country. Egypt has begun vaccinating frontline medical staff against COVID-19 on Sunday using the jab developed by China National Pharmaceutical Group. The vaccine will be provided free of charge first to all doctors and frontline workers treating coronavirus patients, then to other medical workers, senior citizens and people with chronic illnesses. Cut. Eleven gold miners have been rescued in China's Shandong province after being trapped underground for about two weeks. Rescuers are still continuing operations as the lives of ten other miners remains unknown. It's been two weeks of unrelenting attempts to try to get to the miners who gave rescuers a boost when they pushed out a message saying they were all there, rooting to be rescued alive. Before Sunday, rescuers had established contact with only 10 of the miners who are in good physical condition. One is believed to be dead. By late Sunday morning, the first of the 22 trapped miners at a gold mine blast was delivered up to the ground. He had been spotted in the fourth section on Sunday morning and was found in an extremely weak condition. As the day wore on, three more miners were delivered up to the ground. One of them was injured. And later, another three miners were brought up to the ground by early afternoon. By 2 p.m., another three were brought up to the ground. And by 2.44 p.m., two more miners were brought to the ground. Eleven of them altogether were rescued. Rescuers continue searching for more. The rescue team head says rescuers will continue searching for the remaining 10 miners who are still out of contact after the accident. Rescue efforts sped up significantly on Sunday as a tunnel that was being bored out to reach the trapped miners was expected to take weeks to dig. Into the mine was severely damaged and communication was cut off by an unexplained explosion. For a week, there was no sign of life. Then, on January 17th, rescuers felt a pull on one of the ropes they were lowering into small shafts leading down into the dark. A paper note was then sent up on a rope from a group of 12 surviving miners, 11 trapped in one place and a 12th trapped further below. COVID-19 has had a significant, significant impact on viewing of live football matches in stadia across the country. Fans have not yet been allowed into stadia for safety reasons. And this report takes a look at the impact on football. Days when stadiums in Nigeria were filled with football fans during league matches seem like a distant memory, no thanks to the COVID-19 pandemic. Stadiums hosting league football matches in Nigeria now look like these. I mean, the first time we had to play at the stadium and there were no fans, it was like a graveyard. You know, we're not used to that. When there are no people or you don't have persons at the stadium, your fans who have come from far and whatever to come and watch you are, are there or are not there. There's a vacuum. You know, nothing can fill that vacuum. The silence during these crucial football games has been a testament to the new normal. Yes, for sure. This is big, big different without fans in the stadium. So all the players, all the teams, all the players in the field of play need fans to cheer them up. To me, and I think to the entire players, we are not, we are not really, really feeling the, 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 the football very well like when we have fans, you understand? <laughs> Football without chance, singing and whistling from the crowd present at the stadium feels strange to many. Apparently, I think uh, uh, it's half negative, you know, effect on the players. With our fans, they are always behind the team and uh, giving the team support, moral support when we're playing. But not seeing them behind us, I think it hasn't been easy for both the players and the fans as well watching their team. I think fans play a very basic role in the, in the game of football. Playing without the fans is, um, shall I say, it's sad. 
Absence of fans in stadiums has affected the experience of watching live matches. In every stadium, you find fans who are there. Not all of them are your fans. You always have your supporters. Your, your supporters that will beat the band, they will dance, sing your anthem. You don't have them now that you have been told that nobody can come to the stadium. So that's what you miss all the time. It is safe to assume that the health crisis has had a significant impact on the most watched sport in Nigeria. The Nigeria Professional Football League match day six played this evening produced 10 goals and two away victories from six league games. Nasarawa United have reclaimed top spots as they extend their unbeaten run to six league games thanks for a 2-1 away win against Wari Wolves. The Lafayette Bay side have now won four league games and drawn two this season. Sunshine Stars recorded the second away win following a 2-1 win against Dakada FC in Uyo. Heartland fought back from a goal down to beat Aqua United in Oweri. Quara United beat FC Fanyuba by a lone goal. In the English FA Cup, Manchester United have advanced the fifth round of the FA Cup with a thrilling 3-2 victory over Liverpool at Old Trafford earlier today. Liverpool took the lead in an entertaining first half within 18 minutes. United were level within 10 minutes. Marcus Rashford put United back in front just after halftime, only for Mo Salah to equalise. With just 12 minutes remaining, substitute Bruno Fernandes settled the tie with a brilliant free kick into the bottom corner. Tammy Abraham's hat-trick helped Chelsea beat Luton Town 3-1 in the fourth round to help ease the pressure on under-fire manager Frank Lampard. In other games, Leicester City had to come from behind to avoid an upset at Championship Promotion Hopefuls, Brentford 3-1. And the main news again, a reminder of, beg your pardon, main news again as a deadline given by the governor of Ondo State, Rotimi Akiridulu, for herders to vacate the state's forest reserves expired today. A cartel herders association, Mieti Ala, are set to meet with the Southwest governors tomorrow to find a way out of the crisis. That is the news at 10 tonight. Thanks for watching. I'm Amarachi Ubani.